every year in the fall, uh, we, we did a combined one of these back in the spring, you may remember that, but every traditional year in the fall, the university has something they call the Alumni Fellows event. And each of the eight academic colleges on campus invite, select a alum, uh, bring them to campus, they go through some things together with the president, vice presidents, they had a reception last night. And then one of the purposes of this is to really honor an alum that has done really well. And it's also because all of you are going to be alumni someday, and to show you what a person that's not that long ago is the place you are, what they've done with their career so far. So, so as, as Dr. Hopkins uh, goes ahead and talks about, about what her career is, please think of it not only what her career has done, but what you might do as you go forward. So, uh, Dr. Camille Hopkins graduated from Mississippi State College of Veterinary Medicine in 2004. Since 2015, she has served as Wildlife Disease Coordinator for the National Wildlife Health Center, Health Center the United States Geological Survey, commonly referred to as USGS. She's a native of Richland, Mississippi, which is in the Jackson area. After graduating from Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science for her high school and earning a bachelor's degree in biology from Cornell, she returned home to attend our college of veterinary medicine at Mississippi State. As I mentioned, in 2004, she received her DVM. She was in a dual degree program, so she stayed on another year and got a master's degree in veterinary medical science with a focus in wildlife epidemiology. After leaving Mississippi State, she interned at the Virginia Wildlife Center and then trained as a resident in zoologic medicine at the Smithsonian National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Although she really loved, really enjoyed zoo medicine, she realized that her original and true passion was in free-ranging wildlife medicine. So at that point, she entered a PhD program in disease ecology at Virginia Tech. And during this time, she also received training in arborbiology at the CDC. In 2010, the College of Sciences at Virginia Tech selected her as their PhD student of the year. The cumulative effect of all this educational experience led her to accept her current position as a wildlife disease coordinator for USGS, the scientific arm of the United States Department of the Interior. In her present role, Dr. Hopkins oversees USGS's National Aquatic and Terrestrial Wildlife Portfolio, and she represents USGS in interagency efforts to respond to wildlife diseases including those that are zoonotic, and she'll talk about some of those. Current general areas of professional involvement in wildlife disease ecology include the impact of human activity related environmental stressors on disease dynamics, one health, zoonotic diseases, vector-borne diseases, and invasive species. She's incredibly busy. She's a third generation, or three generations for a family have been in Army careers, so in addition to all this, she has served 10 years in the U.S. Army Reserve, the Reserve Veterinary Corps. A year ago, she served in Iraq for, among other duties, including food safety, civil affairs. She provided health care for military dogs throughout Iraq and part of Syria. Dr. Hopkins is married to Vincent, and they have a four-year-old son, Colin, who would have to be named after General Colin Powell. Again, as you listen, this is one of our alums that we're extremely proud of. She's done great things. There's still great things to do. But you ought to see her as a role model. First of all, I'm going to say congratulations to all of you because you are well on your way to becoming doctors of veterinary medicine. I'm going to share a little bit about my journey, a few key points um, that I hope will encourage you. And um, know that I'm not going to talk about everything on my slides, so if you have questions about something you see, please do ask during the Q&A. So, um, so for 
me, um, my early interest was actually to become a wildlife ecologist or wildlife biologist based on things that I read and things that I saw as a kid. But a real transformative experience for me was through the Girl Scouts. Uh, I did a wider opportunity at the Bronx Zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York. Spent a summer there. It's called Wildlife Careers for Women. And we learned about all these different careers. And the veterinarian, like literally I remember he was kind of in the hallway with us, you know, talked to us just briefly for like 10 minutes. But what was key was he told me something I didn't know, that there were veterinarians who focused on free-ranging wildlife and worked um, with wildlife ecologists and biologists in the field for conservation efforts, for research. And I was like, that's what I want to do. So um, my first key point after that is just follow your passion for your career. So to talk about Mississippi, I'm a graduate of the Mississippi School for Math and Science. A couple of things I want to share about MSNS. One, it was really critical for, it was a great experience for me because um, I met the first African-American female PhD biologist. Um, she was my AP biology teacher, Dr. Davidson. She's since passed away. I'm sorry, I can take my mask off. Um, and so uh, she really had a positive influence on me and my career. The second key thing was MSNS um, allowed me to come here. So as a high school student, I came to the vet college. Dr. Jack was my mentor. Worked with him, Dr. Chinling Wong, Dr. Frank Austin, and others. And it just gave me this real positive experience um, regarding Mississippi State's vet college. Um, I have a lot of stuff on this slide that I'm not going to go through, but my family's um, based in Madison County, so I got a lot of experience in the Jackson area. And for me, being interested in wildlife, one of the best experiences I got was local. I volunteered um, in high school and kept going back, like through college, to the Jackson Zoo. And I actually um, mainly worked with the veterinary technician, Donna Todd, who I still keep in touch with. And then the veterinarian would come usually like once a week or so. But uh, it was a great experience, like in terms of uh, what I observed, what I saw, and what they allowed me to do for hands-on. Um, I had friends who, um, who were able to, uh, who could afford to go to some of the bigger zoos and stuff. But when we would share notes, I actually found out I got to do more locally. Um, and the last thing I'll share on the bottom of this, uh, you see a couple of hospitals mentioned. So I was actually supposed to be in the class of 2003, um, but I was burnt out after four years of undergrad, and you'll see why in a moment. So I deferred and went into the class of 2004 and just took a year off to work. I worked full time as a vet assistant at Forest Hill Animal Hospital, moonlighted at the old animal emergency clinic in Jackson, and that actually gave me a love for emergency medicine. So my second point is to maintain your network of professional relationships. Um, so as I hinted, I've known Dr. Jack for many, many years. I keep in touch with him. He's been a great contact and several others um, here at Mississippi State. Um, so my point is, if you leave Mississippi State, don't have the attitude of, I'm not looking back. You know, Keep those connections, because you never know when you're going to need them for your career. So for undergrad, I always had a dream of going to an Ivy League school. And so I went to Cornell in upstate New York, and I thought, I'll stay up here for eight years, go to vet school. Well, as a southerner, after four years of lake effect snow, and the fact that I felt like it was really competitive, like such a competitive environment, I said, I'm going to come back home to Mississippi. And at the time, so you guys know, class of 2004, we were the smallest vet school in the nation. I had 48 classmates. So it was a wonderful you know, faculty-student ratio. Now, Cornell, um, I had a lot of positive experiences. I did some research. Uh, I had an Army ROTC scholarship, um, so that kept me busy. And I also did work study. And it was actually at the veterinary library, which was great because I got familiarized with veterinary resources, you know, the textbooks, the journals, which helped me for problem-based learning, which is what we did when I was here. But the phenomenal experience that I'll never forget is my senior year, um, and I had to petition to do it my last semester, I did study abroad for the School for Field Studies in Kenya. And it was focused on wildlife, ecology, and management. 
And so that really, for me, just honed in the passion that I have for wildlife ecology. And the cool thing was, because the topics change from semester to semester, one of the topics was a wildlife disease, um, wildebeest-associated malignant catarrhal fever. So I had the opportunity to then research and understand this disease. My project was actually focused on human dimensions. So I actually interviewed um, elders of the Maasai uh, who are nomadic uh, herders of cattle to understand what they knew about the disease and how it was having an economic impact on them. So I mentioned that I took the year off, so I'm working, and I was watching Animal Planet, and there was a show called uh, The Great African Wildlife Rescue, and this veterinarian, Dr. Jacobus Roth, was uh, training young veterinarians in wildlife medicine there in South Africa, and I was like, I'd like to do that. So I looked him up, and he had a course for two weeks for vet students, but you had to pay to go, and of course, you know, pay to fly over. So I saved up on that year, and I actually ended up going uh, to the vet student program after my first year here at, at vet school, so that summer, um, which was amazing. And Cobus, uh, he and I built up a rapport, so when I graduated with my DVM, um, and he started an internship program, I was one of his interns. So uh, just to show a few photos of that, uh, it was wonderful working with wild ruminants in South Africa, uh, mega vertebrates, um, and I'm a hurt person, I love reptiles and amphibians, so I got to work with venomous snakes, uh, crocodiles as well. Um, so it was, a, it was a great experience. So my next point is perseverance, because going to South Africa, believe it or not, I actually had a lot of people tell me, you know, you shouldn't go there now, you're just starting vet school, and wildlife, you want to be a wildlife veterinarian? Well, you should go somewhere else, like UC Davis or Florida, you're not going to be able to get a job, it's very competitive, and um, you can't become a wildlife veterinarian straight out of school, you need to have years of clinical experience. But whatever your passion is, follow it, and don't let, don't let the naysayers keep you from following your dream. So after I finished the internship in South Africa, I matched for the internship at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, where I had gone as a vet student for an externship. Um, and Wildlife Center of Virginia was wonderful uh, rehab medicine of free-ranging wildlife, but also we worked with the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries for uh, wildlife health issues. Uh, we did chronic wasting disease surveillance work. Um, um, some issues with black bears, uh, species like the, like the bald eagle, and even confiscated species. They confiscated, somebody had crocodilian species in Virginia, so that was confiscated and they came to us and thankfully I knew how to, I worked with Nile crocodiles, so I was like, yeah, I can help take care of these guys. Um, I then matched in the residency for Smithsonian's National Zoo, where I had also gone as a vet student for an externship, so catch my hint there. Externships can be working interviews because they'll remember you, you make a good impression, and then when you apply, you know, that at least helps rather than just a name on a, on a page. So at the National Zoo, it was really great. Got to work with animals from all over the world. Um, you can see some photos here of that. Uh, zoo medicine was, it was a great clinical experience, but it wasn't my passion because some of what you're going to see clinically is simply because you take a wild animal, you put him in captivity, you're going to see certain problems. Now, of course, the geriatric medicine, that's different, it's very interesting, um, but that, that wasn't where my passion was. I also, to be frank, um, my personality didn't mesh with some of the people that I worked with, so um, I left the National Zoo, but before I did, um, I thought about you know, where will I go after this? How do I get to where I want to go for free-ranging wildlife medicine? A lot of free-ranging wildlife vets did have a PhD. So that led me to look into a PhD program. But my next point um, that I want to bring, up, bring home to you here is don't burn bridges. So even though it didn't work out and there were some personality <laughs> differences there, I left on a positive note, positive communications with folks, kept in touch with them, and I actually just interacted with my former boss as recently as last week, because we were talking about 
the SARS-CoV-2 cases that they had in the big cats at the National Zoo. And we worked together on a White House interagency effort focused on One Health. So the PhD, um, I ended up being the first um, PhD student for my major professor, Dr. Dana Hawley. She had just started at Virginia Tech after coming from my alma mater, Cornell, where she'd been working on mycoplasma, conjunctivitis, and house finches. Um, but what I did was, since I was her first student and I was non-traditional, I totally did my own thing, which was uh, there had been work to show that forest fragmentation uh, could impact a tick-borne disease, Lyme disease, and I was interested in if you change forest structure, how does that impact a mosquito-borne virus that's also maintained in forests? So I worked on lacrosse encephalitis virus, a uh, zoonotic disease. Um, I ended up getting funding from the NIH for that. Um, during my time, I did a lot of teaching at Virginia Tech, loved interacting with students, undergrad, graduate students, vet students, and um, I also became one of the only Americans to take the CDC Arborology training course, which was actually set up for international scientists, and uh, it's a side story I won't get into, but I, I was able to get in and get that training from them at Fort Collins, get their gold standard training for Arborology. And being a non-traditional student, you know, I still wanted to keep up my clinical skills, so I practiced uh, small animal emergency medicine on the weekends uh, while I was working on my PhD. And I'm just showing you some fun photos from my PhD work. Uh, so during the spring, summer, and fall, I was out in the forest. Uh, I was on Forest Service lands, uh, remote areas that were like gated. So it would just be my team and I and the wildlife. So it was wonderful. And during the winter, when we get some snow, I was working in the lab doing uh, plaque reduction neutralization tests, RT-PCR, cell culture work. Um, and I actually also identified mosquitoes because I was trying to understand how forest changes in forest structure impacted the diversity of mosquitoes, including the vectors that could carry disease. So my next point then is enjoy each step of the journey. When, I, when people see the letters behind my name, they're like, oh my gosh, you were in school a long time. And I was like, with the PhD, it's different because, like I said, I was doing my own research getting my own funding, training um, technicians and students for the techniques that I learned from the CDC for doing my work, and, uh, and teaching. And so it was, it was a really great experience. My last point, um, I put up a picture of Dr. George Washington Carver. I like this quote from him. My parents were Tuskegee grads. Um, is a, my last point's about service. So, um, it was kind of funny when I was putting together this presentation and it being September, and I was thinking about it, and I was like, a lot of my life has been tied to terrorist attacks. So remember I said I went to New York? That was in 1993, just a few months after the bombing of our, the parking garage at the World Trade Center. And I remember we went to the World Trade Center, and you could still see like the damage from the bombing. Remember I said I went to Cornell? Oh, no, it was Kenya. The only reason I went to Kenya, I was actually waitlisted in the spring of 1999 because it was, at, it was in late 1998 that we had our embassies bombed in Kenya and Tanzania. So some people said, I don't want to go to Kenya. And that's how I actually got there. And 9-11, I was here. I remember that morning, um, I lived on Gillespie, was driving in, heard about the first plane, came to school, heard about the second plane in the Pentagon, and they sent us home. So, um, I uh, chose then to serve our country. I was commissioned U.S. Army Reserves Veterinary Corps. And shortly after joining my unit, um, I'd only been with them about a year or so, the unit got orders to deploy to the Middle East in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, which is the mission after 9-11, which was not just Afghanistan. There were other countries, so I'll show you where I was in a moment. But the fun thing was I was a junior officer, started out lieutenant, got promoted to captain, but uh, my commander was in one country, and I was in this other country with just me, my non-commissioned officer, my junior enlisted, so I had my own team. And I actually had the highest clinical caseload of all of the veterinarians um, that deployed. Uh, I'll show you the location in a moment, but it was a strategic location uh, where uh, there's a lot of movement of, um, uh, in theater. So dogs were going to Afghanistan, they were going to Africa, they were going to other places in the Middle East. 
So to orient you to the Middle East and to show you where I was, so the first deployment that I talked about was in Qatar, which with recent events now most people are familiar with Qatar or Qatar. Um, I joke because it's the deep south, I joke that it's the deep south of the Middle East. It reaches triple digits, as does the rest of the Middle East, but it's humid too. So it was a bit uncomfortable. Um, last year, unexpectedly, I got orders to deploy to Iraq. Uh, so that was for Operation Inherent Resolve, which started under President Obama. Um, this is when we went back into Iraq because of ISIS or Daesh. So we were there to support that mission. And military working dogs are used by special forces. They're used by military police. Um, so that's, that's why we were there. Uh, so for the clinical side of things, uh, great clinical experience. I saw Dr. Mackin this morning. I was telling him, I was like, I was thinking of you while I was over there. Because when I set up my team, um, I wanted to make sure we had a walking blood bank for our military working dogs. So once they came into theater, we typed uh, their blood. I wanted to know, you know, wanted to know um, what everybody was in case a dog needed a transfusion. Unfortunately, we had a dog that needed a transfusion. Turned out um, he had a bleed. And initially, because of the time of the year, I'm thinking like heat stroke or some heat stress, something like that. Um, you can see me doing ultrasound on him there. Turned out it was from angiosarcoma. Uh, we did splenectomy, we got him, we stabilized him, got him out of theater. Unfortunately, he was an older dog. When they returned him back home here in the US, they made the decision to euthanize him. Um, but uh, as I said, maybe think of Dr. Mackin, um, you know, because of that clinical case. Um, the other thing uh, oops, that I wanted to mention about the clinical, many of you heard on the news that President Trump was doing a drawdown in Iraq. So when I got there, um, as I was doing my transfer of authority, the previous officer in charge, she left and she took half of the team with her. And I was like, really? <laughs> so we covered the whole country of Iraq, um, part of Syria. And we covered not just US forces, but NATO forces as well. Um, so we had like, uh, I remember there was one specific instance with a British uh, working dog. So it was pretty intense. It was me and my junior veterinarian. So I traveled throughout the country a lot um, because it was just me and, and my team. For civil affairs, at that time when I was deployed, I was part of a civil affairs unit. Um, Monuments Men, if you've ever seen that, that's a little bit of civil affairs. Essentially, uh, our job is to support countries after there has been conflict or war in rebuilding their infrastructure. And so for me, for animal health. So um, working in that country, I was able to interact with the Kurdish in the north. Um, they have working dogs as well, so the information exchange was focused on that. You can see a photo there of me with um, the Kurdish and uh, one of their working dogs that they brought to us. And then uh, in the South, working with the Iraqis, um, I actually had four meetings with them through time on various animal health issues. Big one was avian influenza last year, 2020, was outbreak of avian influenza in Eurasia, Europe and Asia. So they were um, dealing with that. The other thing was they actually were dealing with koi herpes virus. Um, they have open systems along the river there. Uh, and they were dealing with that. So I used that as a good excuse to call Dr. Jack. I emailed him and I said, Dr. Jack, how are you doing? <laughs> Can I give you a call? And I called him and we just talked about fish disease. So now I'm a civil servant. I'm a GS-14 in the US Geological Survey. It's a science agency of the Department of the Interior. So we don't do regulatory or management type stuff like USDA does regulatory stuff. We're just scientists. Um, and we support Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, tribal nations through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and we work with state agencies, including Mississippi. And our scientists are all over the country, so I wanted to show you that. My job is to oversee our portfolio for aquatic and terrestrial wildlife disease, marine and freshwater. And the interesting thing I want to share with you is um, I'm in the ecosystems mission area, and most of our folks are ecologists. And so they are dealing with health and disease issues because they're working on a specific species, for example, or working in a certain landscape or ecosystem. Disease is coming in, it's impacting those species, and that's why we're engaged. Now, we do have some veterinarians. Um, so we have a few veterinary diagnostic labs, 
and they conduct uh, wildlife morbidity and mortality event investigations. So we've got diagnosticians, we've got pathologists uh, doing that sort of work for aquatic and terrestrial. And we work on a variety of diseases. I'm not going to go through what's on this slide, but I'll point out I started in 2015. That was the year of the avian influenza outbreak here in the U.S. So it was a really exciting time for me to start with the federal government. And then last year, before I left for Iraq, so the first half, um, looking at how we could respond to SARS-CoV-2. And like I said, feel free to ask me after for, you know, for more discussion. So my last point is to pay it forward. I've talked about service, my military service, my government service. You don't have to do that. But pay, paying it forward can be mentoring the next generation, young people in your community who want to become veterinarians, or people to your right or to your left. Um, so I encourage you to do that through your career. And then finally, work-life balance. My family couldn't be here with me today, but my son and now my four-year-old son, uh, my husband and my four-year-old son are in D.C. Uh, my mom is in Madison County. Um, and I put a photo of my friends and I from vet school uh, when we graduated and took a photo with Bully. But at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. So uh, I'm grateful for the life experiences that I've had. It's, it's been a blessing. Um, but as we get older, uh, it's all about people. So I encourage you throughout your career, you know, don't just hunker down and be like, oh, i got to get through this internship or, oh, I've got to work this hard so I can make more money and, and work this, you know. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the relationships. Enjoy the people, because at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's all about. So um, I, I'm happy for you guys. Like I said, you're starting your careers. Um, I wish you the best with that, and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks for your attention. for how they manage it. So uh, I'll tell you what I know about Kenya versus uh, South Africa. So Kenya is, um, you've all probably seen the great wildebeest migration that happens every year. Because of that, Kenya keeps its parks partially open because you got to allow the animals to move. But what that means is you've got some human-wildlife conflict as a result. Um, there is uh, hunting that happens there. Um, unfortunately, also, there's a lot of coaching that they deal with. Uh, Kenya, when I was there, so again, a long time ago, um, a lot of the economy related to wildlife was more towards eco-tourism than hunting. This is my personal experience. When I was in the Republic of South Africa, there is eco-tourism, but there's a lot of tourism related to hunting. South Africa is different because all of their parks are closed. They're completely fenced in. So it's a different dynamic because now you're talking about carrying capacity, right? The land can only hold so many elephants, so many rhinos. And it was a different, kind of weird experience when I got there because what they do, uh, South African National Parks, is they monitor the carrying capacity. And once they realize the carrying capacity is getting close to where it should, you know, that it's almost full capacity, they will actually sell the wildlife to people who own hunting lands or ecotourism lands to own. So they actually do auctions. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting and weird. So like auctioning off rhinos um, or, or other wildlife. Now they have a lot of stipulations with it. So not just anybody can go up and say, hey, I, I want a rhino on my land. <laughs> You've got to have um, certain fencing. There's a whole bunch of criteria that they have to have in order for them to obtain the wildlife other than the money. Um, and almost uh, all of them will have a wildlife biologist, like full time to manage the wildlife on their hunting land or their land that they're using for ecotourism. And they have to have a veterinary consultant. Um, so the, when I worked with Kobus, uh, he owned a veterinary uh, consultant business. 
So he worked for, he supported South Africa National Parks, but he also supported the, you know, private folks who were going to buy the wildlife. And actually one of our jobs was, um, if one of those rhinos had been auctioned off and this person bought it, um, they would hire Kubis and working with him, we would move the rhino, we had big 18-wheeler type trucks, move the rhino cross country. We were monitoring the health, like I'd climb up every once in a while, like we'd stop, look in, check out, you know, make sure the rhino's okay. Once it made it to its destination, we'd do another like health exam, make sure it was good. Um, so it's, it's a different, different dynamic over there. Um, so hunting is really important for South Africa. Um, it is important for Kenya, but like I said, they tend to be more focused on ecotourism. Um, but there, there is hunting that's done. I hope that helped a little bit. Okay. Yes? So it seemed like you were able to secure a couple of, of pretty solid externships while you were in vet school. How did you, what was your approach for securing those? Did you just start early or, uh, you know, was there a little just lucky opening kind of thing or how did you approach that? Good question. So uh, what I did was I joined as a student a couple of organizations as a student member, American Association of Zoo Vets. Um, they have really great hands-on workshops like for all sorts of animals. Um, when you go to their conference, they have a networking event for students to work with um, the veterinarians. Similarly, the Wildlife Disease Associ Association, which puts out the Journal of Wildlife Diseases, same thing, cheap student membership, and they have these mentoring events. We even did it this last time just virtually. Uh, the meeting was uh, at the end of last month. So that, that was one way. And I joked, because I talked to a student afterwards, I was an introvert. Like I'm, more extrovert now, but I was like really shy in vet school. So what I did, I grabbed friends, and Brittany, I thought I saw Brittany come in, because <laughs> I grabbed her once, but I grabbed friends in vet school, and I was like, come with me, let's go to this meeting together. Okay, I need to go talk to these people, come with me. <laughs> like I did, and so I became more comfortable. And I talked to them, first year, second year, this is the time to talk to them, because usually they'll start accepting applications, I want to say, probably at the end of your second year, beginning of third year. So if you make those introductions now and say, I'm interested, you know, who's the point of contact? Who do I need to talk to? What are you guys looking for, for experience? So that's one thing that I did that was very helpful. And joining as a student member, you get the directory. So you get the contact information for the veterinarians. So then you can find out, hey, who's that veterinarian at the Bronx Zoo? Okay, let me contact them. I'm interested. So that's one thing. Second thing was I was strategic. So I wanted to go places where I knew there might be an internship opportunity or a residency opportunity or something. So I didn't just want to go somewhere, you know, have a positive impression and then they could never help me again in my career. Last thing um, is I tried to choose places that would give me the experiences that I was interested in for my career path. Um, so I encourage you, you know, whatever your career path is as you're, as you're um, setting up your, your externships, think about where do I want to get extra experience. So yes, I did, um, zoo, I did zoo, I did uh, free ranging wildlife, I did exotics, you know, pet exotics, but I also did things like I went to AMC in Manhattan. I actually did that as a mini internship as part of the dual degree program because I knew I needed more internal medicine, emergency critical care experience. And I went to Rebecca Kirby's clinic in Milwaukee when she was still there, um, all of her great emergency and critical care techniques. And I think you guys are still the same, I sort of looked at Dean Hamlet earlier, that you guys probably get, <coughs> when I was here, you had more time for externships than other vet schools. So I was able to just, I wouldn't hop around, I would spend a month or six weeks somewhere. And I tried to find places, admittedly, where I could find housing <laughs> somewhere or get some sort of, uh, you know, figure out some housing situation. So those are my little tips and tricks. I hope that helps. And I saw, because I saw your head, go ahead. And I see you, too. go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering what, well, two questions. So how did you approach the match? And then also, what are your thoughts on combined residency PhD programs? Well, uh, just as I met a student who was a dual degree DVM PhD, I'm impressed with anybody who wants to do that, because how I hinted, I 
can't imagine just going straight on through. Um, uh, so, you know, individual, you know, what works for you. I know that if you, so if you do a residency and a PhD, I guess I would ask a lot of questions before you get into that about how that works because as a resident, at least when I was a resident, like you're, you're on call like all the time. So I'm like, how do they balance you being on call and getting your clinical experience and then doing a PhD. So I don't know, I'm not familiar with those programs, um, but I just say ask a lot of questions up front, talk to the people who've been through before, um, before you go into that. And the first part of your question, say it one more time, I'm sorry. Just, how did you approach the match? Oh, the match, right. Gosh, to be honest, I don't remember all <laughs> I, did that. I think um, from what I recall, so for zoo medicine, zoo and wildlife, at that time, there weren't a lot of residency experiences. So one of the things that I had done is zoo vets, the American Association of Zoo Vets, also meets with the American College of Zoological Medicine that runs the residency programs. So then I was able to interact with the veterinarians who run the residency programs. So I think part of it was talking to people, um, hearing about programs, and trying to figure out what was the best match for me, you know, where would I want to go? I mean, I was thinking about several things, like geographically, where would I want to be, you know, um, what, what type of caseload they would have, what type of clinical experience could I get. Like the National Zoo, which people might not realize, is not just D.C. They have a facility in Fort Royal, Virginia, SICBI, which is Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And actually that was part of the reason I was interested in it because every week I got to work with the folks working on conservation issues as well. So I wasn't just totally in a zoo. And Smithsonian has an international piece um, where they work globally, just like Wildlife Conservation Society in San Diego. So those were things that I was thinking about. Um, in terms of the match, like I said, I just really don't remember the specifics of how I set it up. But I know those were things that I was thinking about in terms of how I would put them into the match. And because I had been to some places, that's also why I ended up, I think, matching with the zoo, uh, the National Zoo, because I think it was one of my top picks um, since I'd already been there. Hope that helps a little bit. I saw, like, yes. So you name dropped a couple groups you were a part of as a student. I'm very much interested in wildlife and conservation. Yeah. Can you say those again? Oh, sure, yes. So American Association of Zoo Veterinarians but also Wildlife Disease Association. And WDA is great because it's not just veterinarians. So if you're interested in free-ranging wildlife, there, there are sessions on wildlife ecology, um, uh, wildlife management, one health. Uh, so it's a little bit more diverse, for example, than the zoo vets. And then, of course, if you're really into the wildlife, um, you know, TWS is great, the Wildlife Society, which has a veterinary group as well. But I wanted the hands-on. So as a vet student, that's why I went to those two groups, because at the meetings, you can usually cheaply get into hands-on workshops. So to work with koalas or marine mammals or something like that in some of these pre-meeting workshops. So that's why I chose those two. I saw another hand. Yes. So you said that when you were here at Mississippi State, you did the dual degree for your master's, right? Yep. Um, and hearing that, all your externships and internships. So did doing the dual degree as like a third and fourth year student, um, did it affect any of your choices as far as your scheduling to do internships? Because I know now it's like they really want you to get a lot of your research classes and stuff your third and fourth year. So did, did that hinder you at all? So the one thing I remember about that was I think I was going to, the way it was set up, I would miss emergency or something. And so that's why then when I did a mini internship, I was like, let me make sure that I do a good emergency. Um, so and really, my, I can't remember, I feel like there might have been something else. But I know definitely, I remember that was an issue. In terms of doing the coursework and the clinical, um, I didn't find it to be a problem. Like I was able to balance it and work it out. And I did most of my, I did courses here, like biostatistics, ME type courses, but then I also did courses at the Department of Wildlife, um, uh, wildlife ecology, wildlife management, uh, wildlife policy and law, things like that. And that worked out really well. 
And I found that I could balance it well for the masters. Like I said, I can't imagine a PhD <laughs> doing that. But for the masters, I felt like it was manageable. And then, uh, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else I'd say on that. Um, I think you do have an extra year for that master's, so you can do something in that fifth year when you're finishing your master's, so that's when you go out and do your I guess, little mini internship because you're yeah. a DBA by then. Yeah, but obviously, but that's when you do most of your external experiences. And so doing coursework that third and fourth year here. Thank you, Brittany. So yeah, um, I thought it I thought it worked out okay the way they had it set up. I did feel like I didn't have time you know, to focus on my veterinary stuff. It was just like fun for me. It was like fun other stuff. So I hope that helps. Other questions? Oh, yes. How much of an effect did the avian influenza have on migratory ducks? Because I know there's been a major decline in migratory down here. So that's a good question. So uh, in the United States, um, believe it or not, if you don't know this, um, every year we see hundreds, thousands of ducks die from disease. Avian botulism, uh, avian cholera. Um, most, when high pap avian influenza came through, um, there was some clinical disease that occurred, but from a, like from a wildlife management standpoint, it wasn't that significant. What was interesting, because they're typically asymptomatic, and they even did uh, USDA and us, because uh, we have a high containment lab, our scientists also did some work looking at those high pass strains in mallards and other waterfowl. And uh, typically they were, they were not showing many clinical signs. What was interesting with the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak was the clinical disease that was seen with birds of prey, with raptors. So our scientists had done a study on avian influenza many years before, you know, experimental, and showed that raptors could show neurological disease. We saw a lot of that. So uh, snowy owls, bald eagles, uh, uh, hawks um, showing clinical disease because they were <clears throat> hunting the waterfowl and then through ingestion infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, uh, interestingly, Canada geese. There were some neurological cases of Canada geese with high path. Um, but the first detection, because I like to tell this story for USGS, the first detection was in December 2014 in Washington State, and there was a die-off of uh, waterfowl in a lake um, in Washington State. Our scientists, like they said, they had seen die-offs die at that lake before, but they, it was just part of their SOP to test for avian influenza. So the actual cause of death, the primary cause of death for the waterfowl, was actually aspergillosis. And high pap avian influenza was just a secondary finding. Uh, but that was the first detection in uh, waterfowl, the northern pintail, it was a northern pintail duck that was the first positive H5 and 8. And then there was a, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting the, the species right now. Um, but there was a raptor who was like pers personally owned raptor that would you know, occasionally hunt on the waterfowl, and that raptor um, got. Uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza as well. So I say that to say it was the aspergillosis that killed them, <laughs> not, the, not the AI. Um, but uh, overseas, so last thing I'll say on that, because that's the United States, so Eurasia, right now, the, the outbreak that's occurred 2020, Europe and Asia, we had an international meeting. So um, if you guys go to usgs.gov, um, we have a website like Wildlife Disease, and we've got a link to the webinars. But we have scientists who presented to us from Europe and Asia, and they are seeing die-offs of waterfowl. So we haven't seen that in the U.S., but the strains that are circulating on the other side of the world, it is killing some waterfowl. Thanks for that question. Yes? Sorry, uh, two part, just because I was curious about uh, what you were talking about there. First off, do, I know you said raptors, but any scavenger birds, are there any effects with them? You mean like vultures or something? Vultures, yeah. Um, we didn't, as far as I recall, um, so thinking back to the science, so I, I could be wrong, but as, as far as I recall, not that I know of, that it literally, that it was birds of prey, like not the scavengers, like vultures, uh, being affected by it. Um, 
but uh, like I said, don't hold me to it. I could be missing some obscure something that I missed. And the second part, do you have an email we can contact you with yes. if you want to get more information? And I'm sorry, I put it on the, the front slide because people were asking me, sorry for flashing through. Let me make sure it's on the front so you guys can see it. There. So mchopkins at usgs.gov. If you Google me, I've got a personal website as well, and you can contact me through that if you have questions. Any other? Yes? As far as asking people to like mentor you, especially through vet school, how did you go about that? And I guess it seems to be more of a, like you find one person that is your mentor that's not given to you, or you know that you find yourself and ask them. How did you go about asking those people, and what are your opinions on just having one mentor or multiple? So I definitely have multiple mentors. So in addition to folks here at Mississippi State, um, <coughs> There were certain people who, when I go to the meetings, like the face-to-face -face meetings, who I just connected with. So Dr. Sharon Dean, she's at uh, um, in St. Louis, St. Louis Zoo. She's a DD and PhD. But I read her writings, her publications. Uh, she talked about conservation medicine, and and I hear her present, and I was just like, I was just interested, you know, in what she did. So I reached out to her, started communicating with her, kept in touch with her through the years. Uh, she was somebody who I talked to when I decided I wanted to leave the zoo. And she was really supportive as I was thinking about getting a PhD, which she had done. Um, admittedly, if I can find uh, minorities for myself, you know, um, I try to reach out to them. So Dr. Sonia Hernandez, um, she's a diplomat of the American College of Zoological Medicine. She's got a leadership role now in WDA. But I would talk to her a lot because I saw her present on her PhD work at our meetings with a you know, DVM PhD and she was doing free-ranging work. And so I guess it was mainly I, I connected with the work that they were doing or the way that they carried themselves and, and I would just reach out to them and you know just say, yeah, here I am, I'm interested, any advice, um, if there are opportunities to work with you. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely encourage multiple mentors. Um, Last thing I'll say on that is uh, the funny thing when I applied to my job with the USGS, by the way, never thought I worked for the federal government. Only did it because I, I was living in DC and someone said, you should try USA Jobs. I thought, I was like, oh. But the first job that I saw, literally, was wildlife disease coordinator. And I was like, well, that's what I want. But the federal government is slow, so I didn't hear from them for like six months. And then I hear from them and I got the interview and I walk in for the interview and the interview panel, I knew two of the three people because they were veterinarians who I've interacted with through my career. And they had been, to me, kind of mentors. So it made me feel comfortable when I got into the interview space. Um, but I'm saying that to say, yeah, I definitely want multiple mentors. And it all depends on what you want to do. But like, I've got mentors for aquatic, for marine, for terrestrial, for you know Africa versus, you know, so, Depending on what your interests are, you know, I think it's good to have multiple mentors and start trying to build those relationships and just ping them and check in with them. I've got students who do that with me, so hope that helps. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys for your time. Uh, feel free to reach out by email. Um, good luck with your studies.